Hi, I'm Dr. Younger, Director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Lab, and today I want to talk about clinical studies, particularly clinical trials where a treatment is being tested, and if you should participate in a clinical trial. So because I don't do any animal research, every study that I present on this channel or that I publish or that I go to conferences and present, every one of those requires human participants. It requires patients uh, who have the condition I'm trying to figure out, and they, they require healthy controls as well. So the studies would not exist, and my lab would not exist if it were not for the volunteers in the studies. So the participants are critical to testing new treatments, obviously. And the biggest reason why clinical trials fail is because they're not able to get the participants they need for to complete the study. Now, this is not an advertisement for any clinical trial. I'm not even going to mention the clinical trials that I'm running in this talk. I just wanted to mention why you may consider being in a study and how you can find out what studies you may be eligible for, which ones are going on. So I use clinicaltrials.gov, and basically anyone running a clinical trial should use clinicaltrials.gov. It's a registry specifically for clinical trials. Every reputable trial, any study that's actually testing a treatment on humans should be registered on this site. Now, not every scientific study is registered, like brain imaging studies or blood studies. They don't have to be registered, but if it's a treatment specifically, it needs to be registered. Now, some trials are legally required to be registered there. For example, if NIH is funding it, but not every clinical study is legally required to be registered. But if they're not, regardless of who the funder is, I'm suspicious. I expect every clinical trial to be registered. And because registering the trial, it keeps the research team honest or it helps them to stay honest because then if they make changes halfway through, clinicaltrials.gov tracks it and so you can see what they've changed. Uh, and that helps keep them from changing things midstream in a way that, I don't want to get into the details, but in ways that kind of maximize the chances of false positives or in going in different directions and, and changing their mind on what they're actually investigating. And sometimes changes are perfectly justifiable, but sometimes they're not. And again, that's what registries help to guard against. So let me show you what this looks like and how you can use it. So we're gonna to go to clinicaltrials.gov. I'm gonna set this up right here while I'm talking. So this is available to everyone in the world uh, that has an internet connection, unless you, unless you're, let me set this up real quick. Unless you're in a country that's blocking it, you should have access to this. Okay. All right. That should be going now. So this first page and you see clinicaltrials.gov is the web address at the top. And this first page basically gives you all the main search options that you need. So let's say we're going to look at something like uh, fibromyalgia right here. So you can put in your condition. It could be fibromyalgia. It can be ME-CFS. Whatever condition it is, you put it in that top box. That's one of the most important things. Now, one caution I have is there's no requirement for the research team to use any particular language when they're doing this, when they're when they're defining the condition. So you may have to use different terms in order to find all the clinical trials. So if you call it fibromyalgia, you may also, in fact, you will also want to use musculoskeletal pain or test chronic pain or chronic widespread pain. For myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, if you put in MECFS, you're only going to get a few hits. But if you put in chronic fatigue, you'll get lots of hits. So that's one of the downsides to this database is that it allows the investigators to use whatever term for the condition that they want. And that means that not one term will give you all the options. So, so do be flexible and test some different, um, 
some different options, some different names for the condition, more specific and more general. So let's do fibromyalgia. And then at the bottom, select recruiting and not yet recruiting. That way you're looking at current or future studies. If you don't mark that, you'll get a bunch of hits of studies that are already completed and you can't participate. And then you can put your location. That's usually one of the most important ones. And I'm gonna put United States in that box. You can put Europe, you can put your specific country, you can put your specific uh, state. And then let's search. And in the United States, current or about to start, we're getting, it looks like 42 trials. So we can take a look, see what we've got here. We've got uh, metformin, that's in Utah. We've got general hypersensitivity in Florida. We've got, um, this is kind of like acupuncture, like electroacupuncture on the ear. So that's being done in Georgia. We've got MDMA, okay, methylene dioxymethamphetamine or, or ecstasy. Uh, which is being used in Massachusetts. So this is just an example. I'm just going to look at the first four. So a lot of trials happening in the United States. If you wanted to know if they're close to you, you can, instead of the United States, I've already got it selected. You can just go to your specific state. Or you can put a city as well and find out what's next to you. And it says in Alabama there are four studies that are currently open and they are almost all mine because I register all of my studies even if they're not clinical trials. I do see one that's a different group out of um, Auburn, Alabama. I do not know who's running that. I'll have to talk to them and see what they're doing. So you're probably going to see that, um, let me close this down, you're probably going to see that nothing is close to you. That's just because almost every trial has a limited radius where they can draw participants from. Like you have to live within maybe 200 miles from the site because there's study visits and it's just unlikely you're going to have one next to you. So when you search and you search for your state or your city, you probably won't find anything for your particular condition. So don't forget about remote trials. There's not many, but I do encourage people to start looking for them. Uh, another problem with ct.gov is that, or clinicaltrials.gov, is that it doesn't have a really obvious way to mark remote studies. And these are studies that are open to everyone. Um, I would suggest leaving the location field blank and then putting remote in the other terms box. And that will pull up a few. And I hope, you know, in the next year or so, there'll be a lot more remote trials. Now, should you participate? In a clinical trial, if, if you did find one that's close and it is possible, should you even participate? So I'll start with the cons to the remote trials. And, and these are things you've probably thought through. They're, they're mostly common sense. The biggest issue with doing a clinical trial is that there's a higher chance of adverse effects from the treatment because it hasn't been tested on a lot of people. That's the whole point of doing the clinical trials to find out. And so that puts you in a group where something that hasn't been seen before may come up and it could be significant. Uh, there are steps to safeguard that from happening and it's not common to have really significant adverse effects in a clinical trial, but it is more likely to happen in a clinical trial than when it's been tested in a million people and we've known something, how it works for the past 30 years you know what to expect. You've seen everything. In a clinical trial, you don't know because it's all new. So anyway, that's one con. Uh, the burden is probably the biggest major um, issue with participating in a clinical trial. So you may it, it may take 10 months or so of participation. Most trials require you to go to a study center multiple times. You may have to do advanced testing, blood tests, maybe neuroimaging, at home, you may have to wear devices that track your activity. It depends on what the study is. Some are simple and some are complex, but they involve some kind of burden, and it may be more than what you can handle. Very few of the studies, as I mentioned before, are remote, so you, you do have to do some travel, which may or may not be possible. That's the second big con. Uh, the third one is 
the protocol can't be tailored on an individual basis. And that's the big difference between a scientific clinical trial and a physician doing medical treatments. Your physician can tailor things specifically for you. So if you're at the lower typical dose and you're having side effects, your physician can say, oh, okay, we'll split that tablet in half and let's try that. And maybe that'll work for you. In clinical trials, we can't do that. We have a protocol. We have to stick to the protocol that's required. And so there's just less flexibility. And so it may be that the protocol won't work for you because we didn't have that flexibility that your physician might have. So um, that's one way you you can't really expect it to be like seeing your primary care physician. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest cons aside from that is that you might get placebo in most clinical trials, which means you go through all of that work, you do all that stuff, you do all the tests, and you never even got to try the active treatment being tested. And that aspect of clinical trials has always bothered me. If you've watched me, for months or for years, you know, I really don't like hundreds of people getting nothing just to test a treatment. I, I don't like getting a placebo only group. And so most of my trials, in fact, I think all of my clinical trials have a one, one way or another, everyone gets to test an active treatment. I do not have placebo only groups. There are very legitimate reasons why, but I still don't like it. And I think that there's some clever research designs that allow me to do what a clinical study should do and still give everyone a chance to try the active treatments. But that's not typical. Most have a treatment group and a placebo group, and then you find out at the end which one you were in. So the pros, um, most clinical trials compensate. Some of them compensate quite well. Most of them just barely compensate enough for a little bit of the time and maybe the transportation costs. So the compensation is usually not very significant. The biggest pro, I think, is that you get to try something that's cutting edge and you may be able to get access to a treatment years before it's publicly available. And that would be the most potentially exciting part of participating in the clinical trial. Every clinical trial is there because the research team thinks it's going to be a huge thing. And one of them may be what's going to be in two years, the best treatment available. And by being in the clinical trial, you can get it way earlier than most people um, get access to it. But the most important reason, you know, because, you know, I think most clinical trials, I won't say they fail. Most clinical trials do not show extremely positive effects. Some do, but most don't. We we do the clinical trial to find out, and a lot of times the answer is no, it's not not promising. So the really the most important thing is it's less likely that the clinical trial will benefit you individually. It might, but you know, we we don't know. It's more likely that it's going to benefit everyone with that condition because it helps drive the science forward and it more quickly gets us to figuring out what treatments are most beneficial to people with your condition. So consider participating if you can. Uh, the more who participate, the faster we get the studies done, the faster we get the answer on that treatment to decide should we move it to clinics and hospitals or do we need to go to something else. Uh, obviously, if you're homebound or bedbound, most clinical trials you won't be able to participate in. In that case, just keep an eye on clinicaltrials.gov. Do a search every once in a while just to stay up on what's being tested because every treatment that is going through the pipeline should be mentioned in clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I just wanted to show you one of the tools that I use, and it's a tool that you have access to and you can use as well. And I'll talk uh, in another week, I'll talk about the upcoming trials that are remote where people who are bed bound and homebound can use, it can actually all be done at your house. And I've talked about this before, but um, as we get a little bit further in the calendar, more specific trials using the remote kind of trial design are coming online and, and are about to be funded. So we'll talk about that soon. So I really, um, really interesting. You'll hear me talk about this a lot. Really interested in this push to remote trials that can be done 
almost entirely, in, in many cases entirely, at the patient's houses, which I think is really important because especially like conditions like ME-CFS, we really have to research the homebound and bedbound because we know very little because they haven't been able to participate in the study. So again, I'll talk about that another time, but I hope that was uh, useful. I hope that's a tool that you can use. I think it's a very useful, it's got, it's got a few, there's a few elements to it that are uh, kind of cumbersome, but it's still a, a good uh, tool. So that's it. And I will see you next week.